This is the pre-lab talk for experiment number two for Chem 110 lab, Accuracy and Precision, or Water, Water Everywhere. The goal for this experiment is to make careful mass and volume measurements and assess their accuracy and precision. We will also introduce the use of common, common labware used to, measure, to dispense liquids and measure their volumes. In this lab, we're going to use the burette and the graduated cylinder. We'll also make use of the dropper pipette. We'll also be introduced to the analytical balance and how it can be used to make very accurate and precise mass measurements. Finally, you'll get to use what you've learned in this experiment to solve a problem, distinguishing, dis determining whether or not an unknown liquid is water or a salt solution. You'll do this by using what you've learned in this experiment. And you'll also get a chance to write a report based on what, what you decide to do. Today's safety pause is pretty simple. There are no specific safety concerns for this, for this experiment, mainly because we're just using water. However, it is still very important that we, we wear our PPE in lab. Therefore, I, as the experimenter, will still be wearing goggles and a lab coat. You probably have talked about accuracy and precision in lecture. However, we'll review some things here. Let's define accuracy and precision and talk about how we will assess those in this experiment. Accuracy, the accuracy of a measurement is how close that measurement is to the true or accepted value. Usually when discussing accuracy and precision, we use a model. We can, in this case, we're going to use a dartboard model where the true value is at the center of the dartboard or the bullseye. If we look at the measurement, if we look at the, the darts that are thrown in both boards A and B, we see that in board B, the four darts are very clustered around the bullseye. This means that these measurements are very accurate. In picture A, the, the, dart, the, the darts are actually are clustered close together, but are pretty far away from the bullseye. Therefore, we can say that these, these measurements are very, are very inaccurate. When we make our measurements in lab, we can use the percent error to assess how, how accurate those values are. The percent error is calculated by taking the difference between the measured value and the accepted value, dividing the, that difference by the accepted value and multiplying by 100. We usually take the absolute value of the ratio first before multiplying by 100. Precision is related to the reproducibility of a measurement. How close together are, those, are the measurements to one another? In picture A and B, we see that our measurements, the, the darts are very clustered pretty close together. This means that our dart boards in both A and B are very precise, although the darts in in picture A are not very accurate since they're not very close to the bullseye. We can therefore say that the picture, the picture A shows measurements that are not very accurate but are very precise, while in picture B the measurements are both very precise and very accurate. When making measurements in a lab, we can assess the precision by looking at the spread in our experimental values. In today's experiment, we will calculate precision by calculating the spread in data values, which can be done by subtracting the smallest value from the largest value. We will divide those by the average in our experimental measurements, which can be calculated by taking the sum of all of our measurements and then dividing it by the number of measurements. We can then multiply this by 100. In table B, you're given criteria for assessing how accurate and precise your values are. 
If your percent error and precision are below 1%, you can say that your measurements have good accuracy and or precision. If your percent error and precision measurements are calculations are between 1% and 5%, you can say that these the accuracy and precision of your measurements are satisfactory. If those calculated values are above 5%, then you can conclude that your values are, your, your measurements are unsatisfactory in terms of accuracy and precision. You'll be asked to reference this table use it using your calculated preci precision and percent error values throughout this experiment. Make sure that you use these criteria when you're asked to assess accuracy and precision. Although we will demonstrate how to use the equipment in, our, in the lab videos, we want to go over a couple of procedural points. Let's talk first about using a burette. First of all, if you look at any burettes, in this lab we're using a 50 milliliter burette, as we will use in most labs, you'll see that the burette is marked every tenth of a milliliter. It means there are about 10 markings between each milliliter marking on the burette. When making a measurement with graduated glassware, we always, we always are able to make pretty, pretty certain measurements of many of the decimal places, except for the decimal place that we're going to guess. For the burette, burette, we're going to guess the hundredths place that is in between the tenths marking. This is our uncertain digit. All burette measurements should, be, should include two places after the decimal. That is, the hundredths place should be included in your measurement. It is also not necessary, whatever you use a burette, you can fill your burette as much as you want. When we use the burette, how when we use a burette, we can, we're typically measuring the amount of volume that is dispensed from, from the burette. We do this by measuring an initial, by taking an initial burette reading and, and a final burette reading after we dispense the amount of liquid we want, we want to use. Since we're taking the different, since our volume is the difference between these two readings, it is not completely necessary to always start at the 0, 0.0 milliliter mark. You'll see in the video that, except at the very beginning of the lab, I don't actually start very close to the 0, 0.00 marking, and that's okay, as long as I know the difference between the burette readings, the initial and final burette readings for each run. When filling a when filling a burette, it is very important to first secure the burette in a burette clamp attached to the monkey bars in the, at each workstation. Then, you can fill a burette by putting some of your liquid reagent in a beaker and, using a, and, and put, placing a, bottle, a funnel in the top of the burette. You can then pour your liquid from the burette into the funnel. This is the safest way to use a burette that will minimize the likelihood of the burette breaking or, or you spilling some of the chemical. Never ever use a stock burette, stock, I'm sorry, a stock, a stock container or bottle to fill a burette. Since the container is usually very heavy and could fall on the burette and break it. There's also the high risk of a chemical spill there. The next note here is how much liquid to dispense. You'll see in the procedure that you're asked to deliver about 2 milliliters and about 20 milliliters. So when I'm in lab, I'm not going to actually try really hard to get exactly 2.00 or 20.00 milliliters. In fact, if I were grading a lab report with a bunch of those values, I'd be pretty suspicious since it is very unlikely, even with a high amount of skill, that you'll deliver 
exactly 2.00 or exactly 20.00 milliliters of liquid. Instead, you want to get pretty close. So if you get 2.10 milliliters or 20 or 19 or nine, let's see 19 point nine zero milliliters those are pretty good values because they are about two or twenty milliliters it is not very important that we get exactly what is asked for in a manual but that we get close to that value and we know our volume or mass measurements very very accurately and precisely you'll also notice that burettes are not pieces of equipment that we keep in our lab drawers. They are instead common lab wear that is typically kept in our general chemistry labs to, on the right hand side of the large fume hood in the center of the room. We're also going to be using an analytical balance in this experiment. There are There is a list of balance rules found in Appendix A of your lab manual, which is posted on Canvas. We'll go over some of the rules that are very specific to our to the labs for this for today. The first rule is that you always want to use some sort of container when measuring when measuring a chemical substance. This is pretty obvious if you're using a liquid, but maybe not as obvious when you're measuring a solid. For this lab, we'll place our water in either a beaker or a graduated cylinder when weighing. For solids, you may also want to make use of a weigh boat, which is a small plastic container that we can use for mass measurements. When you're about to use any balance, you want to make sure that you zero the balance first by pressing the, pressing the tear button. In the analytical balances in our lab rooms, there is a, lar a long blue bar or button on the analytical balance for tearing it. The next two rules are pretty specific to the analytical balance. It is very important that when we use an analytical balance that we never add or remove chemicals while a container is on the analytical balance. Analytical balances usually run about $3,000, therefore they're very expensive pieces of equipment. When we add or remove a chemical from, from a container while in the balance, we risk spilling a liquid or solid reagent into the circuitry of the analytical balance, which can cause damage. In later experiments, you'll see how we can use both the analytical balance and the top loader balance to get an accurate measurement of our weighing of our sample. Another important thing about the analytical balance is that it was invented to actually weigh gases. Therefore, it's a very sensitive piece of equipment that can measure mass out to the 10,000th place in many cases of a gram. Therefore, air currents in particular can, can affect the accuracy of your measurement. It is very important of your weighing. So it's very important that as you make a measurement, a weighing, a mass measurement on the analytical balance, that you close all of the plexiglass windows so that air currents do not interfere with your measurement. You can find some more, again, you can find some more balance rules that may not be very particular to this experiment in Appendix A, posted on Canvas. Hey, have fun joining me to measure water.